Good evening, everyone. Welcome to summer <laughs> and welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society for this evening's public program. I'm Catherine Algor. I'm the president here. And I look forward to all of our public programs, but I'm really interested in this one. For one thing, it reunites two great friends of our society, scholars who have used the society's collections and availed themselves of the expertise of our staff in their own work. And also I find the idea of having the Massachusetts Historical Society have a program on Western expansion very interesting. First glance, you might think it's not on brand, but as you'll see, there is an unexpected connections. And that's really what we specialize in at the Historical Society, unexpected connections and conversations. So after the public program, I encourage you to, to go to our website, which is masshist.org and see what kind of a conversation you can get going as well. So onto the program, and I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Gavin Cleespees, who will introduce our panel. There you go, Gavin. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, and thank you all for joining us in this uh, beautiful spring evening uh, and welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society. For anyone who may be joining us for the first time, we are an in independent nonprofit organization that maintains a research library and hosts a wide variety of programs on topics related to Massachusetts and American history. Um, we are only able to produce these programs because of the support of our members. We hope that you'll return for our future events and we hope that you'll support our work by becoming a member or making a donation to support the Massachusetts Historical Society. This evening, we are joined by historian John Sedgwick and Professor John Larson, who will be discussing John Sedgwick's new book, From the River to the Sea, The Untold Story of the Railroad That Made the West. While, as Catherine mentioned, this may sound like an unusual topic for MHS, um, many of the Western railroads were financed and controlled by New England families. In fact, the headquarters of the Santa Fe Railroad was on Devonshire Street in Boston. So I think this will be a great conversation with lots of connections uh, to the Boston area. Uh, our speakers tonight are John Sedgwick, uh, who is the author or co-author of 14 books and hundreds of magazine articles. Uh, he's written for publications such as the Atlantic Monthly, GQ, Newsweek, and Esquire. He is probably best known for his best-selling family memoir, In My Blood, Six Generations of Madness and Desire in an American Family, uh, and his acclaimed co-biography, War of Two, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, and the Duel that Stunned the Nation, which won the Society of the Cincinnati Prize and was a finalist for the George Washington Prize, and which he spoke on at MHS a number of years ago. Uh, he is joined by John Larson, uh, who is a professor at Purdue University. Uh, before coming to Purdue, uh, Professor Larson uh, served as the Director of Research at the Connor, Connor Prairie Pioneer Settlement and taught at Earlham College. He is the author of six books, including Bonds of Enterprise, John Murray Forbes and, the, and Western Development in American's Railway Age. Uh, we also hosted him just about a year ago to speak about his recent book, uh, Lead Waste, the Culture of Exploitation in Early America. So without uh, further ado, I would ask uh, John Larson and John Sedgwick to join us and uh, we can have that conversation. The conversation can get started. Okay, um, so let me just start. Um, first of all, I, it, just by a quirk, in my you mentioned my journalism career. That, um, I wrote about the Charles Stewart case in, the, um, in Esquire that in it, the year that it occurred, way back in uh, um, 1989. What an extraordinary case that was. And it um, sent Boston into convulsions. And, and, you know, it really has not settled down entirely and until this moment as you say that this awakened some of the, um, the essential issues in the city about racial justice and and class relations and uh, um and it's a, a extraordinary drama as well um but that's another subject I, i'm here as you know to to talk about my book about these two railroads that collided basically in their in their attempt to traverse the west one of them was the Rio Grande, that, um, headed by a dashing Civil War uh, general uh, um, named um, General William J. Palmer that, that started in Denver and with the idea of getting to the Pacific by an extremely unusual route, which was to go due south. And then there was uh, the, to the Mexican coast and hit the Pacific at, at, um, on the western coast uh, of Mexico by Baja California. 
And then uh, um, there was this other line that is of more interest to Bostonians, uh, the Santa Fe Railroad, which, uh, as Gavin mentioned, was headquartered remarkably on Devonshire Street in downtown Boston in a rather grand building that I fear no longer stands. Uh, um, but the, the the Santa Fe started in Kansas and went west on the line that a bullet might take, uh, um, that it was not veering north or south, it was going due west uh, to hit the Pacific, but probably somewhere around Los Angeles if the trajectory held. Uh, and so that there was this fundamental divide between the two uh, um, trains one going um, west by going west, which seems like the obvious thing to do, and the other going west by going south. And then there was the further divide uh, in the, the, the one, the Rio Grande that was going south, uh, styled itself as a baby railroad. It was running on these narrow gauge tracks with uh, um, small uh, um, the locomotives pulling a, a small number of trains. And it was best suited to um, navigating the mountains of where it was starting in around Colorado. Santa Fe was a full-fledged co corporation and and took um, prided itself in its size and its um, its strength and power. And so huge locomotives up front, running on standard gauge uh, tracks uh, and pulling lots of trains behind. And the idea was that it was going to go big and go long. And, and uh, um, so that was the fundamental divide. But then the question of why Boston? Why did, it, why did the Santa Fe, which began in Kansas, why was it financed in Boston, of all places? Well, it, it turns out that as any Bostonian knows, and certainly members of the MHS know, uh, Boston is, ha, is and has always been a remarkably worldly city. Despite its size, it poised on a, a little peninsula facing the brutal Atlantic, you would think that it might sort of cower in fear of the natural forces and feel that it was kind of uh, um, an outlier in some way from compared to New York and Philadelphia. But, but no, uh, th there's always been a tremendous reach of ambition that, uh, for Bostonians. And it was first expressed that, um, in the China trade, that, um, where these ships would go uh, um, across the ocean and trade you know, opium that, um, and tea uh, um, with, the, um, the with the Chinese. And then later, of course, they developed uh, the first textile mills, which was extremely ambitious, drawing from English technology. And then they combined those two things, the technology of the in industrial era and the, the sort of worldly expansive vision of the China trade in this new venture uh, of trains going across the West. So that's why it was Boston that did this. And then I might add, just before I turn to John for whatever question he would like to ask, that is that Boston, surprisingly, was a railroad hub from the very beginning. That in the 1850s, there were more trains in Boston, practically, than any other city. And that in Boston, in fact, was known for this extraordinary engineering achievement, the Huthick Tunnel that uh, uh, went west uh, and that it was the most uh, um, challenging and accomplished engineering feat of its day because it was going, I don't know, several thousand feet through rock, solid granite rock, burrowing through the, uh, um, I think what amounted to the foothills of the Berkshires in order to get west an amazing accomplishment and spoke to the determination of Bostonians to put the lay down track. John, let me uh, turn to geography, which you uh, alluded to in your introduction about the, the uh, Rio Grande going south and the Santa Fe going west. And of course, much of this had to do with the topography of the, of the country they're looking at. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's very interesting, the, um, both of these projects uh, are aimed in the same direction, ultimately, which is the Golden Shore. Uh, however, um, if you try and go straight from the Missouri River to California, you run into this thing called the Rocky Mountains. True enough. Which everyone was painfully aware of and which the, the Union Pacific, of course, had already seized the South Pass, 
which was one of the best ways through. And the Civil War had made it virtually impossible to build uh, the far southern route, which would eventually be the Southern Pacific, but uh, uh, for the moment uh, is, is not being done. So in, in some ways, these two projects, uh, although they sound perhaps absurd and at right angles, are trying uh, in their own way to deal with the, uh, the requirements of uh, a landscape uh, in which there are a handful of decent ways to get straight west through the very through the San Juans and below, uh, and almost no way to get through the, the main spine of the Rockies except to go up and down uh, through South Park or any of the other uh, major valleys between the Front Range and, uh, and the High Sierra. So talk a little bit about uh, how they had uh, addressed this geographical reality. Well, these are excellent questions. The, um, people don't realize quite how wide open the West was in these years. And I should just say which years these were. The, the, the Santa Fe and the Rio Grande uh, um, first came into existence in relation to each other. They be, it got onto each other's uh, um, screens, as it were, in um, 1878. And the, the first um, Pacific Railway, the, the, the junction of the, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, was famously um, created in, on May 10th. 1869, uh, um, with the, the driving of the Golden Spike at the um, promontory point in the Mormon country of, uh, just north of Salt Lake City. And as that was a tremendous uh, um, engineering accomplishment, and it was also a triumph of human will. I mean, the, the Chinese and the, the um, and the, the Irish workmen who laid the tracks worked unbelievable hours at uh, um, a great personal strain and cost uh, um, and and it was a it was a risky venture but of course it, and it and it did succeed in the sense of getting to San Francisco what it didn't succeed at was in creating any kind of commercial traffic that would sustain the line along the way. And, that, and so that, it, it, to my mind, and people don't usually recognize this, it was the Apollo project of its day. It was a demonstration project. It, it was something to show that it could be done and that with the idea, ultimately, that other lines might follow but that other lines did not immediately follow. This in 1869, it was the only game in town. It was the only line across the West. And it went across the West, as you were saying, uh, at a Northern latitude. It was about the latitude of Chicago. Uh, um, and so it skirted these nasty Rocky Mountains uh, uh, well to the North. But by going North, it, it ended up um, being saddled with far worse weather than it would have had if it had gone through the South, but this, they couldn't go South because the South was too much allied with the Southern interests of the Civil War. And we also have to remember that the reason it went to the North it was that it was decided upon during the Civil War when the, the Republic, when the Southern senators and representatives withdrew from Congress and therefore had no say in where this railroad went, leaving it to the Northern interest to decide on the Northern interest own basis, which was to send it across the North that as a military necessity and also as a way of joining, making sure that California and the Pacific Coast generally stayed with the Union. So it was a political ex exercise primarily, and that again made it less of a commercial one. Okay, so then the um, years passed, there's no other uh, railroad in that area, and along comes uh, um, these two, uh, one, uh, this fledgling enterprise, the Denver and Rio Grande by this man that I mentioned, the um, General Palmer. And then there was this other corporate, that much more the, um, larger corporate entity that was headed at the time by its general manager, the, a guy named William Barstow Strong. Uh, um, and he, in those days, uh, um, you could tell a man by his whiskers. 
Yeah, um, that as you can see with every union and the um, Confederate general, that people were identified very powerfully by the hair on their face, and, and that uh, um, and that these two men were no exception. That Palmer had a wonderfully groomed mustache and was, by most accounts, the best dressed man in Colorado, that, that he posed stylishly for every photograph. Strong, by contrast, uh, um, had a beard that ran halfway down his chest and it shook in a grandfatherly way when he, uh, um, when he spoke and, and a, a completely different character. He's somebody out of the Old Testament, that, whereas uh, um, Palmer that is somebody who was out of a romantic novel. And so they were in temperament, they, they were very different. But to get to your question about why they chose the roots they did, well, at that time, amazingly, um, still, it was uncharted wilderness uh, um, where uh, um, across the West. It, you know, it's important to remember it, that it was uncharted, but it was not empty. Uh, it, there were at least 100,000 Plains Indians uh, um, occupying this land uh, and, and lived off of it for generations. But they, they were nomads, essentially. They didn't uh, um, set down the, um, towns the way the Eastern Indians did. Uh, um, they roamed pretty much chasing after the buffalo that they lived off of. And so that they, they traveled very lightly across the landscape. Uh, um, and the, when the train came, of course, that was a, an existential threat to their livelihood. The, and they did battle with it in every possible way that they could. The, and at times, even uh, um, sending, uh, firing arrows at locomotives, thinking that that was the best way to subdue this iron horse that was invading their territory. Okay, so it was it was open it was open territory. That uh, um, there's this. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just, and it was terrifying. I mean, these amazingly high mountain, rocky, the Rocky Mountains that, that were uh, um, covered with glaciers that they were, and then there was burning desert beyond. I mean, so the, it wasn't at all clear uh, um, which way to go and what was there worth passing through. And that's the thing about this wide open landscape is that there were no fixed points that you could orient to. You never knew exactly you know, where you were in terms of value uh, um, the, of the, any particular point of the landscape. And you knew even less about where the next point of value might be. Was let's talk about that enough? just, let's talk about that a minute, John, especially in the case of the DRG. Uh, what were some of the little nodes of value that Palmer wound up chasing uh, uh, as he went, goes up and down north and south uh, through the mountains? Well, that's a fascinating thing because here, you know, one, there's so many different ways to look at this, this story. I mean, there is the engineering aspect, the commercial aspect, the financial aspect, the capitalist aspect. But the thing about Palmer is that you can't forget the romantic aspect. This was a man that, who had fallen head over heels in love with an 18-year-old beauty that he met on a train ride going through Iowa and in the company of her father. Uh, um, Queen Mellon, as she was known then, or to him, Queenie. And Queenie was this beauty from Flushing, New York, a, a woman of some taste and style, but she was a little less than half the age of, of Palmer. Incredibly, they met on the train, they exchanged letters, and two weeks later, they agreed to marry, sight further unseen. Well, how was he going to then actually capture this elusive beauty? She had raven hair that ran in ringlets down her, um, down her shoulders the most. I mean, to Palmer, clearly he was out of his mind <laughs> in love with this girl. And, the question is, she was an Easterner, not only by the, um, where she was living then, but also by orientation and by aspiration. She had no interest in the West. So uh, what did he do? He, he wanted to build a town worthy of her. And he thought that he would set it down in this little place called Colorado Springs. Well, as it happens, there were no springs in Colorado, now, um, in, in Colorado Springs. Uh, um, there were some springs, you know, 10 miles away. But it was an amazing place that he created at Colorado Springs in order to lure her. 
it wasn't a town in any conventional sense. It was much more a club. It was a club uh, uh, whose members were going to be selected by him personally based on certain qualities that he wanted to fill the town with in order to make it a place that would be congenial for Queenie Mellon and Palmer as she became. And so it was supposed to be a place of some culture, arts, that um, they were going to have, you know, um, social clubs, uh, uh, musical salons, uh, um, they had schools, and ultimately, of course, there was Colorado College there. Um, and most importantly of all, what he decided he would have in order to lure this lady to his uh, um, Colorado Springs, he put up a castle. Glen Airy, it was called, and it was styled in a Scottish manner that he knew she would like, and that so he so this was his his initial ambition had nothing to do with the things that you would think he would have to do with. It wasn't like he was trying to put down a place where hundreds of people would flock and that they would um, furnish money for the building of his railroad. Yes, that would be nice if they came, but primarily he wanted one person, <laughs> and that was this woman. Um, so that was his ambition, and it showed something sort of wonderful and fanciful about the West and its wide open nature, which is you could make anything of it that you wanted. Uh, um, it was a potentially a fantasy land. It, uh, you could, it, it was nothing as it was, and it could become anything that you wanted it to be. The, and he wanted, in Colorado Springs, he wanted to be another Val d'Isere or something like that the, um, in the European model. It was, it was alpine, it, it was cultured, it was refined. And it was also a place for, uh, for uh, people to recover their health uh, um, in the dry air and the sunlight. That these were his ambitions initially. And so that the first place that he went when he went south from Denver was Colorado Springs. And in some way, you could imagine that the rest of his line was intended to fund Colorado Springs, that that was always the place of his heart. And that the rest of it was in service to that. Um, and so that, but, it, but still, uh, there was money that he needed to collect. And then, of course, the more track he laid down, the more track he had to pay for, which meant the more track he had to lay down still. And then it, it kind of extended like that. It, it was, uh, you know, in the vernacular, it was sort of ass backwards. Uh, um, and uh, that that was... Uh, um, and that I found fast, and it also has to do with this thing that historians always have trouble with, which is psychology and personality. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's the particular psychology of this man that ended up defining a lot of what happened. It, it wasn't so much a matter of historical forces, it was personal forces private demons. Uh, um, he was he raised a Quaker. He'd fought in the Civil War. He was very anxious about fighting in the Civil War as a Quaker. That there was this warrior side to him, but there was also a pacifist side to him. They were in conflict. Uh, this dictated a lot of what he ended up doing. That, um, and then by contrast, that you have this William Barstow Strong, he of the long beard down his chest. He was a completely different cat. Uh, that he was a corporate leader yeah, of, of the modern style. He was a basic, your basic CEO who had a mission for his company and he was gonna act on that mission. And anything else of it was an externality he wasn't gonna bother himself with. His job was to lay down track and that was it. There was no girlfriend that he was trying to impress. Uh, um, and, the, and also there were no conflicts of the Quaker uh, military man kind of style. So the, when he just went blasting west. So that when they collided at this uh, little town south of Denver, all hell broke loose because they were such different men with such different objectives. And yet here's the thing that was so fascinating. Once they collided, they went after the same thing in the same way. Well, talk about uh, <clears throat> Rattan Pass and why why that became the objective that actually brought them head to head. You write very nicely about this. Book. Well, the Rattan Pass was a, a, a lies at the, the southern end of the Rockies. It, it's the, the last pass on the, it's, uh, in southern Colorado before you get into New Mexico. It's right on that border. 
it's just it's not that much of a of a pass in the sense that it's not a deep V cut into the mountains. It's more as kind of soft U. It's just a slight indentation that makes it just enough easier to get across there than the, um, when this guy, his name was Bucknell, when he was uh, um, the first the, um, pioneers headed west to California, the ones actually who ended up, I believe, in the Donner Party, that, that they they went, uh, they found that that, um, that Rattan Pass is the best way for the, you know, mule, the, um, the oxen drawn carts mm -hmm. and, the, um, and for foot passage across it. Anyway, so it was, so there it was, the Rattan Pass. It was, the, it was not just the best, uh, um, um, means for human and ox drawn passage, but obviously for railroads. The thing about railroads is that they they are built to go fast along the straight, uh, not they don't want to twist and turn, and they certainly don't want to rise. Four, you know, four percent grade is max for them. That means four feet of rise for every a thousand feet of run. So that a place like Rattan Pass, so it dips down low enough. So that with enough switchbacks, they can get over it. It was really the only place where they could. And the Rattan Pass was desirable because it was the gateway to the great Southwest that, um, of New Mexico, ultimately Arizona, mm -hmm. and finally to California, that, um, which was, you know, it, it was, again, it was uncharted. It, nobody knew exactly what the value of it would be, but it was there, it was wide open, and it was, it was there for whoever took it first. Well, so the two men that were, um, it, this is what's so fascinating to me is that, as I say, that the return, the, the Santa Fe was going booming straight west, that, and that Palmer with his rear grant was booming straight south. Well, the Raton Pass lies right in between those two, a little bit more southerly, but it's certainly not on the route west. Now, um, if you go straight west from Pueblo, where they intersected just south of Denver, you would go banging into the, into the Rockies. There, and that there were some mining mines to be um, hit there, but it was it was going to be a difficult passage. So it, Strong had the idea, and he took over the, um, the running the Santa Fe in, uh, at the end of 1877, and, and well, and the, the the time of the greatest conflict was in early 1878. At that time, uh, uh, he was uh, um, the. the he, he came to realize that the only way west was actually to take Palmer's route and go south. Uh, um, and so he ended up borrowing a bit from his enemy. Well, once his enemy figured out that he was borrowing a bit, that he was all the more determined to keep his bit. That, um, and that, because he had been thinking of that all the way along. He was also cash strapped, Palmer was. That, and that for him to make this big blast over the Rattan Pass was a big investment and he wasn't sure he had the money for it. Mm -hmm. So he thought that he would maybe dive into some local mines, scoop up some cash and then uh, uh, make this assault on the Rattan Pass later. The question was, when, this, I'm sorry, go does, ahead. Does this explain then why they turn around and, and waste so much money in the Royal Gorge? Um, it, Yes and no. It, it's it really is just a preamble to what they did in the in the Royal Gorge. It, just to finish the Rattan story, then so so the two of them were um, first. It, Palmer thinks he's going to go over the Rattan Pass. He doesn't have the money to do it. Uh, um, Strong has the money to do it, but Palmer doesn't know when. And then when Palmer figures out that Strong is going to do it, then Palmer doubles down and says, "By God, I'm going to do it first. And then, incredibly, uh, on the night of February 28th, 1878, you get this remarkable situation where two engineers, for, one from each of these companies, is aboard the same Rio Grande train going south towards the Rattan Pass for the exactly the same purpose. And neither one is aware that the other one is aboard. And one of the engineers makes the fatal mistake of deciding that he, he's kind of exhausted at 10 o'clock when the train pulls, pulls in and he's going to have a little rest in the local hotel. The other guy says, no, 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 I'm going to make a beeline for the Rattan Pass. 
stick a shovel in it and claim it for as mine, which he does. Mm -hmm. And thus the, the Santa Fe ends up claiming and, and keeping the, the Rattan Pass. All right, so that's in, eight, in February of 1878. And hardly is that matter settled. The news comes from Leadville, just to the north, that the richest silver mine, not just in the West, but possibly in the world, has been discovered two miles up at Leadville that, that is at the top of, of a narrow but, but steep canyon called the Royal Gorge. And there's only one route up to Leadville. It's going through the Royal Gorge. And with the, that V's down to such a narrow passageway, there's room for only one set of tracks. And who's, are, who's gonna own those tracks? Is it gonna be the Santa Fe? or the Rio Grande. So that ends up being a reprise largely uh, of the battle for the Rattan Pass, but on a mega scale. Of course, the, uh, I mean, Leadville is really of no significance to uh, Strong's uh, strategic objective, um, <clears throat> except that there's money to be made in hauling silver out of there. Um, right. Whereas it fits perfectly in Palmer's planning because he's running up and down the front range and the middle range and, uh, and the collegiate range. I mean, that's what he's doing. So that makes a lot of sense. Yes. And here again, the, the, these two personalities, wildly different, start exchanging roles. Uh, um, the Palmer originally uh, um, had the idea of the Rattan Pass. Strong wanted it because Palmer had wanted it. And then Palmer wants it because Strong looks like he's actually going to get it. And then they both go at it in exactly the same way. They, they become kind of the same guy, even though they were originally very different. Ditto, as you say, in the, um, with the Rattan uh, at, um, the, at the Royal Gorge, where it, it, you're absolutely right that it wasn't really part of the mission uh, um, for Strong, but he knew that Palmer would be lusting for all of the ore that they would be hauling out to smelters as far away as St. Louis. And there was going to be a lot of trains going up and down the um, Leadville. And then there were other things that they could gain as well. And in fact, that even though Leadville was way up there, and it, at that point, a very seedy kind of hell on wheels town, Palmer saw that it could be another Colorado Springs because it would have some great views. And if you stayed away from these seedy mining camps, it could be pretty nice. And, and so he had the idea of reproducing Colorado Springs up there as well as running uh, the ore out and the and passengers in, particularly tourists. Uh, um, and, and then, it, yeah, you're quite right. I mean, it's, it's astonishing to me that Strong departed as powerfully from his mission in order to uh, um, to take keep Palmer from getting it, but you know, here's where I think uh, you know a lot of the historians of the railroads don't get into the personalities and the psychology, but I just think at that point it became personal between these two men, okay. and the, the, it was like a, a Bill Gates, Steve Jobs kind of thing where <laughs> they just simply couldn't let it go. Now, um, if you know, I'm going to get that guy was sort of the message. Yeah, yeah. And it became intensely personal. And it was also something that was fiercely fought and ridiculously fiercely fought. That there were actual soldiers that were brought into this battle for the gorge. That they, there was a team of soldiers that would uh, um, set up shop on the way high on one side of the gorge and hide behind stone forts, roll boulders down on the tracks that the other side was, and then of course, the other side would do exactly the same back. And so the, again, this mirror image of two different men behaving in exactly the same way. Let me take this in a slightly different direction that builds on that business of the, uh, the temptation to make it the personal to get into uh, really sort of, you know, vendettas, uh, one against the other. We see this all over the railroad development stories, one place or another. I've spent 40 years now trying to understand the dynamics of competition in railroad development. And, uh, and I have a visualization that I use, um, which, which to me makes a little bit of sense, but presents us with a problem that almost no one could solve. If you imagine a chessboard 
and you have two competitors, Palmer and, and uh, Strong, for example, and they're trying to figure out what the next moves are going to be in order to accomplish the, the successful end of the game. Now imagine that on each square of that chessboard, there's another chessboard on which a whole bunch of other people are playing their own game yes. and strategizing about what moves to make and what goals to accomplish. And on that chessboard, each square has yet another chessboard in which yet another group of people are playing a strategic game. Right. Now come back up to the level of Strong and Palmer. How do you function when you're three or four deep with free agents able to change the dynamic of the board before you even move? Uh, not well. Uh, um, uh, it, no, I mean, that's the short answer. Uh, and you're, you're absolutely right. It depends on where you set the frame. Uh, um, they set the frame far more narrowly than the frame actually should have been set, mm -hmm. in part because they simply couldn't conceive of anything more. And you are so right. It, one of the things that is so striking about this is how unbelievably complicated it was, how many unknowns there were the risks that um, were beyond anything that could be calculated because you, there were more than you could imagine. It was the, 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 it was the nature of the unknown, that, that there were so many perils. If you knew what the perils were, you could deal with them, but you didn't, and so you couldn't. Uh, um, and just something simple that like, okay, say you were in Pueblo and say there was no Palmer, and you were just strong. Well, there's a 360 uh, um, wheel that uh, you could go in any direction. That, um, which way do you go? And that, that there was remarkably this thousand page um, volume written by an engineer named Wellington uh, um, called the economic theory of railroad building or something to that effect that, that went through all of the calculations uh, about every element that would go into this decision uh, and the the the, um, and the, 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 the questions were countless, you know, the weight of the coal, the cost of the coal, the availability of maintenance crews, the, um, the talent of those crews, uh, um, the quality of soil, the, the, um, the degree, the angle of, of incline, uh, um, the width of the river. I mean, like, uh, there are a zillion things. There was no way that you could calculate them all. And it was so touching that Wellington would write a thousand pages trying to enumerate them when you couldn't actually make use of any of this. It was just too much. So what they did instead, and Palmer did in particular, that, um, was he said, screw that. Now, we're just gonna go to, a ta to whichever town will pay me the most to build a line there. And that's what I'll do. And that way I'll at least get that money. And who knows whether it's actually gonna pan out, but at least I'll have the money to have built it there. And so what he would do was essentially a raffle offer uh, um, that he would, yeah, he would, it, it would, he would sell his train tracks to the highest bidder and that if town X was going to pay 50,000 and town Y was going to pay 75,000, he'd go to town Y. I mean, like, why wouldn't he? Um, and then he would go back to town X and say, look how much money I made for town Y. Look how the, the how much building and construction there is there, how much more valuable though that town is. And then they would go, they would give their 75,000 also. So, it, so they made it simple because they, it had to be simple. Anything more than that, they just couldn't deal with. The, um, and then it, the, what happened was what I was describing with the Rattan Pass, which was that once one of these railroad men that made a line to one in one direction, and the other uh, railroad man discovered that, he realized that the clearest validation of the value of any line was when somebody else wanted it. 
And if that guy wanted it, then you wanted it all the more. And you wanted it to get it before he could get it. And that in, in, um, produced this, not just a rivalry, but this weird game of spy versus spy where each was trying to hide his intentions from the other and, uh, um, and while trying to divine uh, the other ones at the same time. And, and, and that's, it was espionage as much as anything else that they were engaged in. And then, of course, I mean, to, to answer your question more fully is that in the end, this, this fight over the, uh, um, the Royal Gorge was resolved at several levels up. You know, the, the, the reigning uh, um, king or god uh, of the railroad world was Jay Gould. Jay Gould could crush any other railroad man, including Cornelius Vanderbilt, like a bug, because he was just so masterful that he knew exactly how to deploy not only capital, but um, information, that he could leak certain bits of news to newspapers and drive down or up stock prices to his advantage. And he was playing a game that was way beyond what other people were capable of. So in the end, when these two people, when Palmer and Strong were fighting and fighting and fighting endlessly over the Royal Gorge, Palmer sat in and said, fellas, uh, um, here's the deal. The, um, you, Palmer, are going to get Leadville. You get the rights to Leadville. Good for you. Um, golf clap. And then uh, you, Strong, are going to get the Rattan Pass and the route to a south to, through the southwest. Never the twain to meet. We're going to draw draw a line through this pueblo. That Palmer, you say to the north. That um, Strong, you say to the south. And that's it for the next ten years. And shake, and we're done. It was, this thing had gone on for two years. It had gone up to the Supreme Court. It involved soldiers upon soldiers. It brought in Bat Masterson uh, um, from Dodge City to try, and, and it was this physical fight. That, and it was not resolved until Gould said, enough. Uh, um, and then in a matter of minutes, it was done for the, exactly the reason you said. This guy was playing four-dimensional chess, uh, and the others yeah. were playing checkers. Uh, and they, it, <laughs> they, they were just, he was just better at it. You brought up the Apollo mission early in the conversation. Uh, and it's very clear that the Western Railroad development uh, uh, was anything but efficient. Yes. Uh, incredibly inefficient, chaotic, and wasteful, and all the yes. rest. Richard White uh, has has baked that in as a central thesis in his uh, in his recent book, Railroaded. To go back to the Apollo mission, if we had approached the moonshot the same way that we approached the transcontinental railroads, mm -hmm. would we have ever gotten to the moon? Meaning, if it had been a commercial enterprise rather than the, if, if it had if been it publicly had, funded, if it had been chased freely by any and all um, of the uh, of the interested parties who might want in on it. Uh, no, I, I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, listen, after the Apollo program, there's been a long wait uh, um, for commercial interests like Elon Musk and others uh, mm -hmm. um, to, to move into this void that, that you do. The, I think the question that you're raising goes to the heart of this issue that we are facing today and America has always faced about public and private interests. Yes. Uh, um, public interests and private interests. How do they work together? How can you uh, make sure that they work together? How do you make it sure that they don't just eat each other up? No, um, and it, it's a fascinating and deep question. But in, in this particular instance, the, you, you saw the problems on either side. The, on the public side, you saw an incredibly wasteful uh, um, uh, endeavor by which a, a few tycoons made fabulous sums of money unfairly getting awarded uh, um, federal contracts that were not available to anybody except the most insider insiders. And you saw uh, uh, this colossal political scandal that resulted when it turned out that all of the insiders in Congress were being paid off uh, um, to put this bill through. So, that, so you see that on the public side, like the worst of it. You see the, the corruption, the inefficiency, the waste. 
but you did get a railroad. Now, um, so you have to set, remember that. And then on the private side, the, um, that you have this incredibly wasteful, ridiculous, excessive uh, um, competition between railroad lines that don't, that do end up yielding some stuff in the public interest, but mostly they consume a lot of the, um, you know, energy, money, that space that um, it, that it was not the way God would have done it if he would, if he was going to be in charge. Uh, um, and and so you you get it on both. I mean, neither is sufficient. Both have to work together. There's tremendous inefficiency and waste on both sides, and yet. The magic is that it did work, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, the trains did get laid. They also have a, they have a, they have a common outcome in the sense that the moonshot still hasn't produced any enormous capital gain. Right. And the transcontinentals didn't really produce a significant economic boost until probably the mid to late 80s after the second round of depressions. And by which time almost all of those companies had been bankrupt once and right. started over again. And, uh, and yet they were at least on the ground and sooner or later there would be traffic. Um, whereas if Elon Musk had gone to the moon first, what would he have? He'd have a, a flag on the moon. <laughs> Right, which is what we had. No, um, right. it, yeah, it would. It, I don't know what the Musk flag looks like, uh, um, but we we would know. That, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was also a tremendous capital ex expenditure and a huge risk. Yeah, um, and there was also the fact that it had never been done before, so you, people didn't know how to do it. No, um, but you know, I would say in defense of the of the Western railroads, the, I have to say I became a fan of the Santa Fe. Good Bostonian that I am. Now um, that I, I really felt that the, the the Santa Fe did a lot of great things for this country. That um, that it brought in it, it brought in a high style for one thing. Uh, that the, the Santa Fe that um, joined in partnership with the um, the Har the Harvey houses, Fred Harvey now, um, mm -hmm. uh, of a uh, uh, New York restaurateur who had the grand idea that a, a railroad would be a much more enjoyable experience if there was some fine dining on board. Yes. Uh, um, at first, they were in the train stations. Later, they were in the in the trains themselves, and it was an amazing transformation that um, that, that those Harvey houses uh, um, brought to America. For a number, in a number of ways, all of them to me very interesting. One was they standardized uh, things. It was the first franchise that you know, and yes, it ended up being McDonald's, which you know we might have mixed feelings about. But we, but they also extended a a kind of the the, the kind of sameness across the West that, that to me that was a statement about the unity of America that, that this was all we were all Americans here we were all eating at Harvey House uh, um, it just as McDonald's could be said to be a kind of unifying factor in American life or used to be still and a wonderful I, hotel in Winslow Arizona that the Santa Fe built it was yeah. all it's still yes. there. You can stay there. It, I was there uh, summer before last. It's a wonderful look back on that whole. Uh, well, absolutely. Uh, and, and not only was it stylish, but it also introduced the notion of tourism to the West, which has been central to the Western experience. Uh, and that they made use of a lot of indigenous cultures. Uh, um, and, you know, it was deplorable on one on one level that the trains come in and uproot uh, the Indians, the Native Americans from their way of life. But at least, but a lot of it was captured in the end by the, the, the Santa Fe, first because they'd sent in a lot of photographers, but also brought in anthropologists that, um, in order to record these Native American ways and to extol them and they create museums and displays and uh, um, photographs of them that, um, in order that, that sort of spread the word that it would not have been spread otherwise. Uh, um, and that they were able to, that, that some of the architecture of these uh, um, Harvey houses 
captured the indigenous the architecture of these towns. And so the, the adobe, for instance, for instance of Santa Fe, that, um, became, because of the Santa Fe's own hotel, became sort of the dominant style. And it didn't just get quote unquote ruined and turned into the, you know just more of America. That, um, and then ultimately, of course, as it went, and the Santa Fe was so much more successful at building towns that lasted than the Rio Grande ever was. The Rio Grande left Colorado Springs, and that's about it. Uh, um, whereas uh, the Santa Fe, the, you know, and Santa Fe itself had built up the, um, Albuquerque, uh, um, El Paso, and then the, um, and the champion of all is Los Angeles. And the people don't realize that Los Angeles is a railroad town and is a railroad town because the Santa Fe got there. It had a railroad before that, the Huntington Southern Pacific, but Huntington didn't want to build up Los Angeles because he was so favored San Francisco. He didn't want Los Angeles's port to rival San Francisco's, so he made nothing of it. And it was only when the Strong arrived with his train that they that induced a competition in train fares between them that drove the price of a ticket from Chicago on the Southern Pacific down from one hundred and twenty five dollars to a single solitary yeah, yeah. dollar, and that that created a pandemonium that um and people flocked into Los Angeles like never before, and the, it put the town on this meteoric rise to become what it is now, the second largest city in the United States, which it would not have been but for the Santa Fe. And that's what railroads can do and still can do, I would say, under the Biden plan, is that, mm -hmm. that they create value where they go, that they turn these nowhere places into somewhere places. And there's a combination of things, too, that people need to recognize is that it's not just that the railroad got there. Is the railroad got there with a lot of advertising and promotion. The railroad was able to, to, to make clear that Los Angeles people was paradise. It, it, was, uh, um, it was a place of eternal sunshine. It was a place, and then it brought out oranges from the, um, the orange groves, distributed them around the United States so that people could hold these glowing orange orbs in their hands, so succulent. And it was the best, best advertisement for Los Angeles there ever was. And that was the basis of the sort of garden culture that, that, um, that Los Angeles wrote on. And that, you know, you then get the rose gar the, the rose, uh, the roses of Pasadena, the Rose Bowl, the Rose Parade. Now, um, you get the palm trees that come in that, um, to make it seem more exotic than it was otherwise. They're not indigenous. Those were brought in largely by the Santa Fe to turn it into what the Santa Fe promoted as our Italy, uh, that was actually the term for it, that they wanted to plant an image of Los Angeles to Easterners that would be very appealing. And um, Easterners had, had heard about Italy, many of them had visited it. They certainly seen pictures of it. So that when there was our Italy on the West Coast, they flocked to it. I have a copy of a land uh, poster for Santa Fe uh, Colonization Department. Uh, in which they refer to the uh, the Santa Fe Railroad as the banana line, huh. giving the very false impression that the entire route is a place full of a cornucopia of fruits and vegetables and terrific agricultural, even though it's about 90% desert. Uh, yes, sadly. A wonderful uh, um... piece of, uh, you know, sort of squint squint advertising from the late well that's it i mean some of these promoters were pretty shameful shameless eh? and that they would you know some horrible bit of barren north dakota was being eh, um hailed as the garden spot of the Northwest or something. Yeah. And of course, exactly. these poor people get there, spend their last <laughs> dollar and discover this is nothing. Uh, um, and in fact, this happened to poor Queen Palmer uh, um, that when she actually went out to Colorado Springs before Glen Airy had been built and many of the other buildings that um, had been in place, she discovers this dreadful mud swamp and she you know that's kind of the end of their relationship right there i don't need to spoil the story but no, um it didn't go as palmer had hoped oh, this is a uh, 
fabulous uh, conversation, but I think that we might want to take a couple questions from the audience Please. just uh, sure. to let the audience see that. And uh, I would just remind the audience that we, we uh, use the Q&A function. So please type your questions into the Q&A and we will get to as many as we can. Uh, so there is a, a question from Peter who says, uh, could you say just a word about how this crazy competition extended into Mexico and how the Mexican Central Railroad was incorporated in Massachusetts? What a good question that is, Peter. You're a genius. Uh, um, yeah, initially, um, the, the story of Mexican railroading as it pertains to America is fascinating. Mexicans both uh, um, lusted after American trains and feared them deeply. And you have to remember that, of course, Mexico had come up on the short side of the Mexican-American War of 1848, and that they were deathly afraid when um, the, um, Wilfred Scott actually got almost into Mexico City, um, coming in from the, the coast, and forced the, um, the Mexicans to capitulate. And that, that with that experience behind them, they were really afraid that an American train would come whisking down from the Texas border and be in Mexico City with thousands upon thousands of troops in a matter of hours. And how could Mexico possibly resist that? On the other hand, the, um, they noticed that Americans, Americans' industrial might was bringing it unparalleled pre, uh, prosperity that Mexico and Mexico was struggling by, by comparison. So they wanted these trains and they didn't want these trains. And there was a tussle over this for years until Porfirio Diaz, the, the man who was originally elected but ultimately became a dictator in Mexico for 30 years was a solid railroad proponent. And in fact, his backers were called railroaders uh, um, because of that. And so he decided that, that actually he would be willing uh, um, to take an American train. And just at the point when Strong, the, um, with the Santa Fe, was, was trying to get into California by the most unusual means that you can imagine, which is actually a plan taken from Palmer, wouldn't you know, which was to go down the Mexican coast. That to a to a port called called Guamos, Guamos uh, um, uh, that's maybe 150 miles down, uh, um, and that he would then the, the plan was that this uh, what they called the the um, Sonora Railroad would go down from the Arizona border to this port, and that at the port the ships would then take goods at first overseas to Australia and the Far East, but more importantly, around to California, and that they would break the hold, the stranglehold that uh, um, Huntington had from there. It didn't work out. Now, um, it, it, was that, it, it was just too difficult to deal with Mexican language, Mexican government, Mexican, um, and just as a, a foreign country. But what it did establish was that the Americans could then build a line uh, um, down into Mexico. And Palmer, as I said at the beginning, had originally had this idea of building to Mexico himself. Sure enough, Strong beat him to it. But when he realized that, Palmer said that he was going to do something even bolder, which was to build two lines, the one that goes straight down from El Paso into Mexico City, and another one that would traverse the country east-west from the Gulf on the east um, to the Bay on the west, and that, and that he was absolutely determined to do this and got some, and, and made some headway. He'd been trying for this since the early 1870s. Well, once he realized that Strong had succeeded with his Sonora Railroad, now, um, that he then wanted, he thought this was his time. It was not his time because Diaz had been impressed with what Strong had been able to do and awarded to Strong the very plan that Palmer had um, wanted for himself. And that so Strong was given the rights to build down from El Paso. And that poor Palmer was left with these far worse, far less valuable um, that, 
um, rights to build down to Mexico City from the, uh, further to the southeast. And it was a much more difficult route that he killed himself trying to get there. He spent money like he wouldn't believe. And his effort ultimately petered out. But Strong's that um, it, it did succeed. That was the Mexican national, I think. And that was amazingly, the, um, that was a Massachusetts corporation. The, um, and it, um, he was the one, of course, to build, through, to put the first transnational train through Mexico. So um, we also have a couple other questions about um, the Boston involvement. Um, one person asked, uh, which Boston firms invested in the Santa Fe and other railroads in the 70s and through the 90s? Uh, what was the relative investment amount for Bostonians and railroads versus other major development investments, uh, such as mines and commercial buildings? Um, and that sort of com can be combined with another question that came in that asked about the role of Boston uh, capital in terms of whether or not they exerted uh, control over picking the routes um, or if they were, you know, engaged in trying to change that? So, uh, well, it's a really good question. I mean, all of it, the, there was, um, I, I'm trying to think, the, the original investment house that I, foolishly, I can't um, think of the name, although everybody will know it, that, um, that had a, 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 was able to infiltrate the board that, um, and to, uh, um, and gradually take it over. I mean, it's kind of an, it's an unfortunate story because Boston basically became more like New York with heavy investment interests, uh, um, not private individuals, uh, um, but a, a sort of a, a corporate mentality. Now, um, it was Kidder Peabody now, um, was the, the, the firm that came in and that they, um, that they, they, they've then put a lot of their people on, on the board, booting out the traditional, the, the earlier Boston gentry, the, um, the, of what I call the Boston crowd that, that had previously populated the, um, the board. And they were also, the, um, they were much more detached and much more, and, um, and much more insistent, needless to say, on pro in immediate profitability. And that they weren't at all caught up in the romance of the West, that they were, it, it was just what you imagine about um, in investors of the Goldman Sachs variety today, where they are, um, they're, they're primarily interested, wouldn't you know, in, in profits and the rest of it that um, they, they, can, they, they simply can ignore. And so that in the end, when even though Strong had reached Los Angeles, uh, that he ended up getting ousted from the board by these very same Gator Peabody interests, uh, um, who just didn't see it that see it his way. What they saw uh, um, was not an enormous a, a accomplishment of the of the greatest empire, the railroad empire, that um, then in existence, except possibly for the Union Pacific. What they saw was too much track. That was being that was too costly to maintain, and so they made the the sheer dollars and cents calculation that Strong had to go, that, um, and that he just simply did not want to answer to these people. That they were they were corporate in mentality, and their corporate mentality did not extend to the Santa Fe Railroad's interest. They weren't part of the sort of inbred culture. They seemed to come at it from outside, and that that really uh, and that was the end of Strong. Uh, um, that he um, that he was forced to resign. Are you suggesting that these investors were not interested in an opera house for Queenie? <laughs> yeah, I am suggesting that. Uh, um, it, the and you know, it, basically, in in some ways, the Santa Fe uh, um, was hoist by its own petard. Uh, that it was, I, I think, it was Santa Fe Inc. They were both incorporated, the the Rio Grande and the Santa Fe, but the, the Rio Grande was run much more like a sole proprietorship where there was one guy who made all the decisions and he was, as he thought of it, the, the proud papa of this, uh, of his own little family. That wasn't the way the, the Santa Fe did it at all. The, the, that way, the Strong was essentially the CEO and later the president um, of the company. And that it was, it was run in the corporate style with a, a mission to which everyone saluted. Um, there was no 
uh, there was no personality to it beyond uh, um, these uh, overriding corporate interests. It was sort of a, it was chilly, but it was effective. Uh, and notice they got to the to the to the Pacific, and um, the, the Palmer did not. Well, uh, I want to thank you both, and I want to be conscious of people's time. Um, and I believe uh, Catherine has rejoined us here. Oh, I just want to say. You got to love a conversation with history, hair, and the Harvey girls. There you Thank go. Thank you so much. This was terrific. Great. Well, thanks to everyone for Thank joining you. us. Uh, consider buying a copy of From the River to the Sea, uh, which uh, is available uh, at bookshop.org and at local bookstores. So thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, John and John. Bye, right. everyone.